Thank you everyone for coming out. It means a lot. Um, I'm always amazed when so many people come to just hear me speak about my life. Um, today I'm going to talk about my experience with mental health, um, different things I've been through and ways that I've cope with my own mental illness and hopefully you all can relate to it or you can, if you know somebody who has been through depression or anxiety or any type of mental illness, this can help you know how to better understand what they go through and better understand how to help them. So I'm from North Preston, which is the largest black community in Eastern Canada. Um, it's a great community, beautiful community, beautiful people. Um, it's a very family um, vibe there. Everyone is like a big family. Um, so me growing up and feeling lonely a lot and feeling depressed. It, a lot of people couldn't understand that. Um, they couldn't understand why I was always sad. I couldn't understand why I was always sad because there were so many loving people around me. Um, so many people that were there for me if, they, if I needed it. But one thing about depression, um, if you know anything about depression, it has this way of tricking you into believing that you're the only one that's experiencing it. So it's a very, very lonely journey, even if you have these lovely people around you. And as I was a kid, I played sports. I was a part of hockey team. Went to high school and I played football and I always felt like I had to put on this mask um, and not, not be able to be my true self and talk in the way that I really wanted to talk. Um, growing up around toxic masculinity, like all of us do, um, and having that feeling like being a man, you're not supposed to talk about your feelings, you're not supposed to be vulnerable, you can't show emotions, um, you're supposed to be the protector, the provider, the macho person. Um, this really played on my mind because I was always sensitive, I always was compassionate and I cared about people, but I always felt like I couldn't be that person because of what society told me that I'm supposed to be. Um, society tells us you're supposed to act this way, you're supposed to look this way, you're supposed to, especially even if you're a black man, you're supposed to hold yourself in a certain way. Um, And that really made me very depressed, just feeling like I wasn't normal. So throughout my teens, it was really hard for me. There was this one day um, in high school. Um, it was my last year of high school, and I hated school mainly because I didn't want to be around people and feel like I just had to talk to people. Um, it was really just me feeling like I didn't fit in, I couldn't be my true self, um, and it was really hard for me to go to school every day. Um, but this one day, my last year of high school, I remember I went to school 
And I thought to myself, I need to figure out what's going on in my mind. And I went to the library and I went to Google and I typed in, why am I always sad and why am I so afraid to talk to people? And when I think back, it's a silly thing to Google, but a lot of people grow up feeling that way and they have that question. And I Googled it and everything came up as depression and social anxiety. And I printed off these things and I brought them home to my parents. And I remember showing them to my mom, who's sitting right here. She's so supportive. And my parents didn't know much about mental illness. Um, it wasn't really talked about in my family, in my community, in my group of friends. Like, we didn't talk about mental health at all. Um, but my parents told me they believe that they believe what I'm telling them, and if I need help, then we're gonna get the help that I need. So from that day on, this journey started of me trying to get better, and this uh, this journey of self development and growing as a person, it became this obsession for me. I, I went to my doctor and I told him everything about how I felt, um, how I felt alone a lot when I'm not actually alone and I have these great people around me, how sometimes I just didn't want to be here because I was that sad. He, um, he put me on medication. Um, that was a good help for me, but it wasn't everything that I needed. And for about five years, I went back to change my medication. I did things like go off of my medication because I thought that I got better. Because one thing about antidepressants, when they start working, you start to feel better, and you start feeling like you don't need them anymore. But that's not how it works. You have to keep taking them. And if you do want to come off of them, you have to wean yourself off of them. And unfortunately, my doctor didn't stress these things when he gave me medications. And it made me feel some anger towards the healthcare system because of that, because I was coming off of medication and not knowing how to correctly come off and feeling so ashamed because I was going through withdrawal symptoms and blaming myself for this. And now when I think back about it, I was just somebody that really wanted to get better. And I was being really hard on myself because I didn't know the correct way to come off of medication. I didn't know what I know now that I'm supposed to go back and say, this isn't working for me, so give me something else. Or tell me, give me more information. Like, this is what you're here for. But I didn't have the courage to do that in the past. And it was really rough for me. And it got so rough that one day I actually wanted to end my own life. I had such a buildup of anxiety and depression and I felt so hopeless that one day when I was at work I remember it was like I just blanked out and I walked to the pharmacy at my work, I worked at the hospital at the time, and I would fill the prescription, and I took a lot of that medication uh, in an attempt to end my own life. 
And I remember even as I was going home, my dad worked at the same hospital as me and he drove me home. And I was sitting there trying my best so hard to not let him know that I wasn't okay. Um, just shaking and holding myself. And I was just from my years of covering up this depression and this pain that I was feeling for so many years, I was pretty good at hiding it. And he didn't know that I was feeling the way that I was feeling. And I went home and I just went straight to my bedroom and I put on some soothing music and I just laid there. And I remember laying there and thinking, this is the end. Like it's and when you have a moment like that where you think it's over, these thoughts come to you, like these different epiphanies started to just pop in my head. Like I was thinking, okay, this is really extreme. I am trying to just end it all. But why am I trying to end it all? Like, what's the real reason behind this? Like, what's the root behind this? And I realized that it was nothing external. It was all within me. And my mind was just racing and racing. And these thoughts started to come to me like, oh, if it's within me, then can't I change it? It's isn't it within my control if it's within me? Um, because growing up, I was always, I always felt like the underdog. Like, even when I played sports, I was always small, small like I am now. And I played hockey and football, and I was mighty. I was so small, but if, I, if there was a huge football player in front of me, <laughs> I was so small, but I would run right into him. He'd probably fall down, but I would get back up and run into him again, and fall down again, and then probably get hurt or something, and then tell my coach I want to go back in. He's like, chill. <laughs> but that was me. That was always me. and. These things started, come, started to come to my mind when I was laying there and I was thinking about how people admired that about me and how I influenced people from being that way and how people saw me as an inspiration because I was like that. And I thought about my mom and my dad and my brothers, my family, my entire family that's so loving and how they looked at me. And I was thinking, I just need to figure out how I can see myself in that way, just a little bit, and I can work on it. And all of these things were going through my head while I was laying in my bed. And I ran out of my room and I just told my parents, I need to go to the doctors. Um, they asked me what was wrong. I said, I just need to go right now. I didn't say what was wrong. Um, and I went to the hospital and I got the help that I needed. And although that was such a dark time of my life, I feel that it was the most important time of my life. And it's brought the most joy in my life. Something that made me feel so dark and feel like there is no hope made me see so much beauty in the world. I remember when I was in the hospital and I was laying there and I was talking about all these things that I want to do. I remember talking to my mom saying, I want to be a public speaker, I want to be a filmmaker, I want to help people, I just want to help. And at the time, I didn't do any of this stuff. Um, the only other time that I did public speaking, I did it in 
junior high and I basically blacked out and I was like, I'm never doing this again in my life. <laughs> so I was laying there saying all of these things, but my mom seemed like she really believed it. And then it was so much motivation that just took over me and I found purpose. I, I was like, I can help. I can really help people. I can do this. And this bright, this bright um, person that I became, it, it wouldn't have developed if I didn't have that dark moment. And the reason why I share that is because a lot of us go through so many dark things and I'm not going to, like I'm not minimizing that experience. I'm not saying that it's not a terrible experience or not traumatic. That time for me was traumatic. But one thing that I've learned is through things like mindfulness, we can use our brains, instead of letting our brains use us, we can, instead of reacting from things, like I reacted at the hospital that day, and I just went straight to refilling that prescription. Now, if that feeling were to come over me, I would, I'll use mindfulness, and I'll sit back and I'll think, okay, why are you thinking this? And is it really that bad? And 99% of the time, it's not that bad. And you can get over it. I've, um, I've, I've learned a lot about myself over the years about who I really am at the core. And that's what I bring when I come to these talks. Um, it's complete, raw vulnerability, realness, and just who I am. Because we get caught up a lot during the day and just we work, work, and we forget that people next to us could be going through something. We forget that we're going through things and that we need to address things. Um, and I think it's so important to take those moments of mindfulness where we just sit back and we think, okay, why am I acting in this way? Or why am I thinking what I'm thinking? Thinking about your thoughts is so important. Like, why do I think the things that I think? Um, but when I went to my doctor and I received my medication for my depression, I wasn't told this. I didn't, I wasn't told you, um, you can do this thing called meditation and literally just sit there and feel less anxious like 10 minutes later. Um, I feel that if I would have been told that this process would have, um, it would have been sooner. But at the same time, I feel that things happen when they need to happen. I, I definitely, I'm still dealing with depression, and depression isn't this thing that I feel just goes away at some point. It's not a beginning and then an end. I feel like recovery is a lifelong process, and some days are a lot worse than others. Sometimes I don't want to get out of bed and I feel like there's weights attached to me. But 
but I tell people that life is, it works in waves. It goes up, it goes down. And when it goes up, you got to remember <laughs> that at some point it's going to go back down. So while you're on your way up, you got to get those tools that you need. You got to make sure that you're meditating. I think you're not meditating. Make sure you have that thing that you can go to. For some people, it's nature. For some people, it's the gym. Um, just to make sure that when things get rough again, it's not as dark and as deep as before. And I can say with confidence now, even though I still do have those down moments, I never will go back to that point where I want to end my life. Because when things are going great, in the back of my mind, I'm still thinking, okay, things are great right now, and being the moment, being the moment and enjoy it, but remember, keep your support system around you. Remember to be grateful for the people around you. Remember that things can get bad really fast, like they did in the past. So you do things like meditate. I meditate very often. I haven't been doing it lately, because I've been a bit on the down, but I'm, I'm trying to come back up, and the meditation is going to help me with that, though. <laughs> so it's going to be okay. And I go to the flotation tank, where I lay in just a body of water in a tank, and um, it's just me and my thoughts in there. I am not distracted by my cell phone, I'm not distracted by anybody else. It's just me. I have to face myself. And it's a cool feeling getting in this tank. Too. It's, it feels like a, you know, a sci-fi movie sometimes. <laughs> And I also do things like my filmmaking and just being creative. Um, I love fashion. I love um, art. I just remembering those things because when you're depressed, depression, it has that way of making you feel like you're the only one that's dealing with it, but it also has this way of making you forget the things that you enjoy. So it's just reminding yourself of those things that can be so beneficial. Oh, and with this. No matter what it is that you or a loved one are going through, it's possible to get through it, no matter how dark it is. Take it from me, somebody who went through such a dark time and felt like there was no way out of that dark time. Somebody who lived their life feeling like they couldn't speak to people, even just one-on-one -on -one because of social anxiety. But now I speak to large groups of people, which most people <laughs> don't do. Let that be inspiration and motivation for you to know that there's really, truly nothing that you can't do. Thank you. so much that was so inspiring and
thank you. Now we have an opportunity to ask questions. So we have folks that are emailing questions in. Uh, Francis will share those. And we also have two folks from the Office of Workplace Mental Health, Colleen and Patricia, who have microphones. So if anyone has a question in the room, please lay it down. We have one over here. Hi, how are you? I guess this is more a question for your mom. Uh, if she could answer. She just left. Oh, okay. She'll be back. Okay. Uh, was there anything that she probably could have recognized earlier on from you um, to say, okay, I think my son may have depression um, that she may see now and didn't recognize at the time? It's a good question. Um, Wait, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 We'll, we'll check in with her when she gets back. I have this question from right here, too. Hi, Tyler. I met you before. I don't know if you remember. I came to an event that you spoke at, and so thrilled to see you again. Thank you. Tyler, um, you mentioned that a uh, few of the tools that you use is um, meditation mm -hmm. and the floating. Um, device, yeah. the flotation device. Um, I've, can you talk a little bit about how the idea of being with oneself through meditation and the flotation device helps you when, in fact, feeling so alone in the world? Like mm -hmm. these are tools that you actually have to be alone when you meditate, yeah. right? Can you speak to about how that has, you know, how that supports not feeling so alone in the world, but yet you're doing it alone? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I've realized that a lot of my depression came from me not being okay with myself. And so I wasn't okay with sitting there and thinking about me. <laughs> um, that was a painful thing for me to do. Really painful and scary thing to do. But with meditation, different types of meditation practice, and studying things like Taoism that I study now, like, um, these things, they teach you to sit with yourself and be gentle with yourself. And when these things come to your mind, like sometimes things still come to my mind when I meditate, things that if I were to say them out loud, people would say, oh, that's horrible, don't say that about yourself. But when I meditate and these thoughts come to me, these not so good thoughts, I don't judge them. I don't think, oh, why am I thinking about this? Why am I thinking this way about myself? I just observe it and I think, okay, is this accurate? And usually it's not. <laughs> usually, we are a lot better than we give ourselves credit. And one other thing with the flotation tank, it, um, it's complete isolation. And not often in life are we just with ourselves, ever. And with nothing, no technology around, um, just us. There's basically never a time when that actually happens unless you're far away in nature by yourself. And I think that's so beneficial because it brings a lot of clarity. It, um, it doesn't, it lets you think about life in a way that isn't influenced by the outside world. And that's one thing that I really love about it. And also, in the flotation tank, there's a ton of salt which relaxes the body, so that feels great. Okay. Mm -hmm. Did you want to ask the question? Oh. oh, sure. Yeah. Question for you, Mom. I had a question, yeah. Sorry, I had a question for you. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 
<laughs> my mom doesn't like speaking. She, in that's okay. Maybe you could speak for. It. I was just wondering if there's anything in retrospect now with your son that possibly when he was younger, dealing with the depression, were there any signs that you uh, may have not seen then, but now looking back that you do see? Um, back then, he was really, really quiet. He's still quiet, but he does talk a lot more. He does express himself a lot more. You know, being a mom, I have three boys, and they're all quiet, so I just thought he was like the rest of them, very quiet. Um, but yes, I see a big difference in him. He's so um, confident now with everything that he does, and um, he'll talk to me about everything and anything before, not many words at all. Um, yeah, he's definitely have changed over the years. All for the good. Wonderful. Just a reminder to those that are online that you can email your questions in. I think the volume was down um, before. They couldn't hear at the beginning. So if you're online, you can just email your questions in to owmh at novascotia.ca. And we have an online question. Okay, you're next. So one question uh, from online, and it says, how can we educate more people in our workplaces about depression and severe anxiety, such as signs to look for in people that are suffering both at work and at home? Um, I think that places need to just bring in experienced people who know what they're talking about when it comes to mental health. Um, and do workshops, um, bring in peer support workers that can be there for people when they're um, going through a hard time, who can relate to them, and just making sure that things like workshops and public speakers are visiting these different workplaces um, on the regular. And yeah, I think that's. There's a question just back here and then in the front, and then we do see you in the blue too. Yeah. When you were in that dark place and you made the decision to get help, what did other people do that helped you to come to that decision? Or was it yourself being at a low point and pulling yourself to the, make that decision yourself? Like, is there anything specific that your mom did to help you? Are that friends did to help you? Yes. Um, my mom definitely helped a lot. She, um, I remember I, at one point, wouldn't leave my bedroom and wouldn't talk to anybody. And my mom <laughs> called Community Mental Health and she came to me and said, I called Community Mental Health. This is what's going to happen. <laughs> and basically, just took charge. And thankfully, when I went to Community Mental Health, I received so much help. Um, it changed my life. So, my mom doing that thing, just doing, just doing it, not even asking, and just saying, "Okay." I called them and, and I was a bit discouraged at first because there was a wait time and wait times are very bad in Nova Scotia and pretty discouraging. But I remember, um, I remember even at one point I was like, I'm just not going to go um, because I don't want to wait this long, which didn't make much sense. but. <laughs> My mom was like, you're going? <laughs> and that was a huge help. That was the best, one of the best helps I received. Yeah. We have a question here. Hi, Tyler. Uh, thank you for sharing. Um, a question that I have is, uh, in your community, do you find that there's more open uh, conversations about mental health, or even in the province in general? Um, see, 
in North Preston, we haven't, like, we didn't talk about mental health at all. So I'm like the first person in my community to ever <laughs> speak about it, um, which is challenging. It's really uncomfortable sometimes, but I have to work through that discomfort and remember that there are kids like me in that community who need somebody like me to say, oh, I've been through that too, it's okay. And Finally, I feel that people are starting to talk about it. Um, mm -hmm. It's definitely, it's definitely um, an issue that is addressed now. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hi, um, I was just wondering when you said that there were some mornings that you didn't feel like getting up and going out. Is it better to have somebody to encourage you to get out, or should they leave you to deal with what you need to deal with? That's tricky, because sometimes I appreciate it when people are like, okay, it's time to get up and they kind of have things planned for me. But sometimes I'm a force to be reckoned with. <laughs> If somebody is telling me to get out of bed when I really don't want to. Um, so it's hard to say, but um, I definitely think it's good to be gentle with yourself when you don't want to get out of bed and to be like, it's okay. Um, and to be kind to yourself and those people supporting you who um, who can get you out of it if they are kind and gentle with you. That's so much easier. Yeah. Thank you. We have another question online. How do I support my daughter who struggles with depression and anxiety? She's 18 in her first year of university and she's away from home. Huh. Um, I would say I would say to be there for her as best as you can and to find the resources for them. Um, there in Halifax I know there are so many different places that I didn't know about growing up. Um, but I know them now, like Langhouse, um, a great place for youth between ages 16 and 29 um, and it's like a big clubhouse <laughs> and it's, we don't go there just talking about mental health all day. We talk about how we feel and talk about sports sometimes, like just everything, life and it's a good place to build relationships and a lot of those drop-in centers like that of really great helps and just making sure that she's seeing a doctor and getting the proper help that she needs, like the talk therapy and the medication if needed and doing things that she really just loves to do. Yeah. Great, thank you. We have a question here as well. Tyler, thank you for sharing. My question is, and be really interested in your opinion on um, what your opinion is on technology today and how, or it does, it, does it play a part or does it not play a part or does it have an impact on our youth's mental health? Yeah, um, technology has a huge impact on our mental health. And It scares me sometimes because I see the youth with the phones um, and it's different from the way that uh, myself or everyone in this room, I'm sure, would use the phone and it's like they live on it. And the thing is, like social media, it's not real. It shows one side of 
somebody's life. It doesn't show everything. Um, I show a lot of the dark and the right things, but most people aren't going to show you when they're having a bad day. So people are, a lot of these um, young kids are coming up looking at things like Instagram and Twitter and Facebook and thinking, oh, I have to be like this person that I see on my phone, not thinking, oh, wait, they're just showing me the good stuff. They're not showing me the tough times that they're going through. And that can lead to a lot of anxiety and a lot of depression and a lot of loneliness. Um, a lot of people feeling like they don't fit in because they don't fit into that Instagram feed that they see. Um, but I also will say that although there can be a lot of bad with social media and um, technology in general, there's a lot of good that you can find with technology. But I feel that you have to look for it. You have to search for it. Like I've done something called neurofeedback. That's a technology where you can basically see your <laughs> mood, basically. That's what it is. It's like another form of meditation. And that's an amazing technology. And the more that we focus on technology like that, then that's, that's the stuff that can help the people coming up and making that stuff the cool thing to do instead of looking at the good in somebody's life and all day and thinking that that's how you're supposed to live. There's another question just here and then I'll get to you. Thank you for sharing your story. Um, you talked about there being highs and lows and that when you're at the highs that you need to make sure that you're collecting and you're identifying the supports that you have so that when you get in the lows you do have a network uh, that you can leverage. Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes when you're in your lows it can be difficult to actually reach out and actually leverage the network that you've established. So can you talk to anything that you personally do or how to get through the lows enough that you can actually leverage uh, the support network that you established in your highs. An important thing that I do when, um, when I have my highs, I have some great friends around me that know a lot of my darkest <laughs> secrets and darkest moments, and I let them know if you see me acting in this way or if you feel like I'm starting to isolate myself, call me out on it. <laughs> um, because that's the way that I like to be approached. Some people probably want to be approached a different way and that's fine. But that's a huge help for me. I have a few friends that check in on me frequently to make sure that I'm okay and if I'm starting to isolate myself, they don't see me for a long time, they will call me and they'll be straight up with me and say, I feel like you're depressed right now, what's going on? And you need that. It's, um, it's really good for you um, to have people that can be upfront with you in a gentle way and not in a nagging way. But Thank you. Here's a question. Thank you. Hi. Um, I'm just wondering, so we kind of talked about workplace and friends and stuff, what about people that are part of your family and like how, how, what advice do you have for people that have siblings or other family members because it's a little bit different sort of uh -huh. atmosphere. Do you have any feedback on that or? Not like, it doesn't have to be on a personal level, but just sort of like, it's, I think it's a different interaction maybe? Yeah. Um, it definitely is different with family. Um, and I know that when it comes to family, it can be a lot more uncomfortable to approach somebody that, in your family that's dealing with something because you don't want them to feel like you're intruding, you don't want um, 
them to get angry at you with, and these things are fear, things to think. Um, and I definitely say that if you are a family member to somebody that's struggling, just don't, like, don't be hard on yourself and know that it's, it's probably hard for that person to show how much they care and love you in this moment, but they do. It's just that depression that is trying to take over. And just be there. Listen. Listening is so important. Sometimes I talk to my mom, I just go on and on. <laughs> and I'm probably annoying, but she listens. <laughs> and it makes me feel better. <laughs> I have a question. Um, thank you for being so brave. You're thank so you. inspiring. We need more toddlers in the world who talk thank about you. how they're feeling for the benefit of all of us. Um, what do you do? What advice would you give someone who, um, someone who's very close to them, you know they suffer from depression, anxiety, um, other social anxiety, other issues, but they're, they're not willing to, uh, to address it and they don't want to own up to it. Mm. They avoid. My answer to that changes a bit. Um, I have a new answer to that um, because I recently had to interact with somebody that didn't want to come to terms with it. And I remember this was a friend of mine and she um, was definitely really going through a lot and a lot of depression and just being really hard on herself like, oh, I'm supposed to be able to go to work right now and I'm supposed to be able to um, speak to people and have fun right now and I'm like, you need to be gentle with yourself and she's like, I don't deserve that. And I remember saying to her, if I had a daughter and she was saying to me the things that you're saying to me right now, would you tell my daughter that she doesn't deserve to be gentle with herself and to be okay and to for things to be all right and in that moment she said no i would never say that and i was like then stop saying it about yourself <laughs> because we need to look at ourselves in that way we got to remember that we still have that little child in us we still have that innocence in us no matter how many things have happened that made us feel like that innocence been, has been taken from us. Remember, it's still there, and we got to nurture that part of us and stay in contact with that child-like side of us that doesn't take things very serious, that's fine with just laughing at things, and because that's when we were most happiest. Yeah. Probably have time for maybe one or two questions. Any, any other question? Right here. Hi. Um, I'm wondering on a professional level if there's something that you'd say people around you do like on a day-to-day -day basis that may be helpful, knowing or not knowing. I mean, you're, you're a public speaker, so they may know, but if before, you know, mm -hmm. they knew like something that is maybe unofficially known and, and uh, yeah, just something that was you found helpful. Um, I'd say the most um, beneficial things that my peers do for me is they check in with me and ask me how I'm feeling and it's not like the walking through the hallway. How are you doing? <laughs> but it's not that way. It's the go sit down and tell me how you're feeling, like really feeling. Um, and that helps a lot. And then when I am done working, we do debriefing and we um, 
talk about things that came up during the day and if it was a stressful day we talk about it and we're there for each other and just being okay with being vulnerable around each other like my peers they know that I they don't really do the I'm not the greatest at the small talk stuff, but I'm really good at talking about like really deep things. Um, <laughs> and so they come into that world with me and they talk about the deep things with me. And, um, yeah, just being honest with me. Okay, the last question, which one? I, I tried to ask two or three questions, but others asked them. Um, I, I do want to ask you about, you talked about tools in the toolkit, and one of them is medication. Mm -hmm. And what I hear sometimes is, well, I don't want to take any depressants, or mm -hmm. like, there's a stigma around even taking the medication sometimes. Yeah. So I'd like to hear you talk a bit about the importance for you of finding the right medication to help you, and um, you know how important that is to your journey and your wellness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, um, when I first started taking medication for my depression, I remember I was ashamed and I felt like there was something wrong with me. I felt like I was crazy and I was really hard on myself for it and it took a lot of me being more mindful and just researching different things and understanding myself more um, and putting things into perspective and remembering that sometimes we need something to help us. It's like if you are diabetic, if you um, have an injury that you need to tend to, you're not going to say, oh, I'm too ashamed to get this taken care of. But when it comes to our mental health, it seems like that's the case. So when I, um, when I started to look at it in that way, like I compared it to my physical health, how I go to the gym for stronger muscles and to be in better shape. So it only makes sense that we need to do the same for our brains. And if that means taking a medication that's going to be a tool to help, it's not going to be the end all be all, but it can be a great tool. If that means that that can help, then we have to use that. In my opinion, it just wouldn't make much sense to not use it. Um, and it is a process. It's a long process it's at times. For me, it was a long process. And like I said, it took me five years, around five years to find the right medication for me because of the amount of side effects. And I feel like um, medication for mental health, it gets a bad rep a lot of the time because of these side effects, but i rather have a side effect like dry eyes or something instead of feeling like I don't want to be here. And I think that's something to really think about. Yeah. Thank you, Tyler. Thank you so much for, for joining us today and for inspiring us with your story. And on behalf of all of us, we want to we want to thank you for, for sharing, um, being so compassionate and being so courageous. And and um, we wish you the best moving forward. And, and we've learned from you. And we're going to go out and we're going to keep the conversation going. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you.